All right. If you open your Bibles to Second Chronicles, not Corinthians, Old Testament Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter number 24. As you're reading through your Bibles this year, if you're reading it in the chronological order and you're looking at some of the things, you're probably coming across some of these chapters. You may have already gone through them. And um, I tend to read and uh, I will, I'll be reading the reading chart plan that we've got, but I'll find things that as I'm reading them, they kind of arrest my attention to the point that I get stuck in that chapter reading it and then I'll start dissecting it and then looking at what it said in Kings as opposed to Chronicles and how it's connected and and all the juicy stuff that comes out of it for application. I heard somebody say a couple of weeks ago, I was at a, a conference, we were talking about how to deal with addictions. And uh, we were trying to get education on how to help people dealing with addictions in their life and, um, and what leads to addictions. How do people even get to the place of getting addicted to whatever it is? And um, we were, they were in the course of it, they talked about meditation. How do you meditate on things? I'm not talking about meditation as in like, you know, om. I'm talking about meditation as in like meditating on the Word of God and, um, and getting the things of the Word of God into your mind. And this is what he said. And when he said it, I thought, well, that's what I do. Um, some people think, well, I've got to read 50 chapters today or else I'm just not right with God. I don't think God's up there with a tally machine going, okay, Eric didn't read 50, he read 49, he's on the bad list. You know, I don't think it's like that. What you're supposed to do is you read and you read until, well, this is what I do. I'm not saying you're supposed to, I'm saying this is what I do. I'll read until it's something that is important to me. I'm, I'm getting something from that that pertains to me. And then I will mark that in my Bible. I'll look at it. I'll study it out and read through it. And then I'll begin to meditate on that every, all day. I'll be thinking about that principle or that thing. I may think about it for a couple of days. The next day I'll read something and some, I'll read until something else. It may be a chapter, it may be five chapters. And I'll, until I get something that that day I can meditate on and kind of draw in on. And so that's what I would encourage you to do is read your Bible. Well, that's what I've been doing. And as I read through um, Second Chronicles 24, I read it through it a while ago marked it up, and then I read through Second Kings, and I was catching up with Kings, and I read through, and I thought, okay, that's the spot from Second Chronicles 24, put them together and kind of looked at a blend of what's going on with that. And so I want to preach you a message out of Second Chronicles 24, um, with this, this being the title, Your Ability to Stand, Your Ability to Stand. Um, I want to start reading in verse number uh, 1 of chapter 24. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Zabiah of Beersheba. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. This little phrase here needs to be underlined if you're going to understand this at all. All the days of Jehoiada the priest. All the days that he had Jehoiada the priest in his life. Now, what, what this, when you go back and look, this, this kid had a rough upbringing. His father was killed. Uh, his father wasn't doing exactly right. His father was killed. And his grandmother, his father that was killed, his, his grandmother, his, his father's mother decided, I don't want any of the offspring, so any of my grandsons to take the kingdom. So she killed all of her grandsons and decided she would reign. Well, they found that there was one, the one-year-old grandson. They took him and hid him away inside the house of the God. And Jehoiada, this priest, was involved in kind of raising him up and working with him. Well, he was one-year-old when they hid him away. For six years, they kept him hid away. In his seventh year, Jehoiada said, it's time. He set up a guard of men around, set this kid up in the, the, the court there, and then crowned him and anointed him and made him the king. Well, Athaliah, his grandmother, who he never really knew, yells, treason, treason, comes in, has a fit over it. Jehoiada says, take her out to where they have the horses and kill her. And so they take her out and they kill her. She's a very, very wicked, wicked woman. And, um, and so they killed her off. So Jehoiada becomes kind of like the leader, the mentor for this young man, Joash. And Joash does that which is right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada, the priest. Now, I'm, I'm preaching on the ability to stand. You'll see it as we get halfway through the message that you need to have an ability to stand on your own. But I want you to see in this first part and in the second part that the influences you have in your life, how people influence you in your life, it will make a difference in your life. 
The influences you have will make a difference in your life. They'll play a part in how your life ends. Now, let me give you a couple of things. Give me the points in the message. Your commitment to the things of God will be affected by the people you allow to influence your life. Your commitment to the things of God. Don't worry about um, him walking around. He's just talking to different people. He's having a good time. Don't worry about him. Everybody's kind of watching him. That's way less important than me right now. And not about me, but about the Word of God. So, so watch that. Your commitment will be affected um, by the people you hang around. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Your courage and your confidence will be affected by the people you allow to influence you. The consequences of where you're going in life will be affected by the people you allow into your life. There are some verses in Hebrews 13, 7. It says, Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Watch. Considering the end of their conversation. Consider where the leaders you've got, the people you've got that you're allowing to have the opportunity to influence you. Consider where they're taking you, where the end of that will be. Now, let me say this. Consider... Anybody you're allowing to influence you, good or bad, consider where the end of this journey will be. If I follow their guidance, their leadership, their influence, if I follow it to its completion, where will I be in life? I've told people many times before, the road you're on, they've come to me for counseling, the road you're on will lead to something. And when you get there, I'm just telling you, based on what I know to be true about people, about law enforcement, and about the Bible, it will not be good when you finally get there. And they've said, oh, well, I'll do it anyway. And they're confident. And they move forward because of the influence they've got in their life. Let me tell you, if you have good influence in your life, they're trying, good influence is trying to get you to a good place. And so he says, you can have good people in your life. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. If you've got someone in your life that's following Christ that is trying to be your leader, it would be, would not be a bad idea to follow them as they take you closer to Jesus Christ. And so let's read through this. I want you to see that while Jehoiada was in his life, watch the, the commitment, watch his courage and his confidence, watch his consequences as we read through this. Look at verse number three. And Jehoiada, Jehoiada, Jehoiada took for him, um, yeah, Jehoiada took for him two wives and he begot sons and daughters. And it came to pass after this that Joash was minded. Now, I, I, I marked that in my Bible. That he had a mind to do something. His commitment was to repair the house of the Lord. It had been torn down and trashed by the old regime, Athalia and the very before that. And they've just tore down the things of God. And here, this young man, while he's got a good leader, his commitment that is in his mind and in his heart is, I have a heart and a mind for the house of God to improve it, to make it better, to restore the things that have been messed up in the past. So he has a mind to repair the house of the Lord. And he gathered together the priests and the Levites, and said to them, Go out in the cities of Judah and gather of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year, and see that you hasten in the matter. Now, this is, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to pick up reading again. But not only was it in his mind to do it, he was motivated to do it. You know, there's a lot of people that say, you know, I really, I think a lot of the house of God. And there's some people that say, I think a lot of the house of God, and I actually am motivated to do something that improves it. It wasn't just in his mind. It was, he was motivated to do something about it. Now, not only that, when you look at this commitment, it says, how be it the Levites hastened, uh, hastened it not. So they did not make it a, a, a real, um, something they were trying to, to force and do and carry out. They just kind of took up the offer. They weren't doing anything with it. So watch what he says. And the king called for Jehoiada. Now, Jehoiada would have been the leader. It would have been the guy that's been ministering to him and leading him. He called for Jehoiada the chief and said unto him, Why hast thou not required of the Levites to bring in out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness? Why, why haven't, you ha- haven't you done something with this? So I said, number one, his commitment to the things of God while he was under Jehoiada was, was for God. It was for the house of God. He was minded about the things of God and motivated for the things of God. But not only did it affect his commitment, it affected his courage and his confidence. It's not easy to go to the person that's the leader of all the priests. It's not easy to go to the person that's been your mentor and say, hey, listen, 
Something's got to be carried through here. It's not just a matter of I said it and nobody's doing it, but listen, gather up. Something's got to be done here. We've got to follow through. It's not just something I said and it's something I wanted, but nobody's doing it. Now it's got to be something you carry out. And it was that you see him, and it's going to be important for later on. You see him saying with confidence and with courage, you've got to do what I have told you to do. It's important. And you see his confidence and you see his courage. Let me say to you, you get around the right people will help you to be committed to the things of God and will give you courage to stand up for the things of God. When you, when you read it, look, he says in verse number 7, For the sons of Athalia, that wicked woman, had broken up the house of God, and also all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord did they bestow unto Balaam. And at the king's commandment, they made a chest, and it set it without at the gate in the house of the Lord. So they set up some place to put the money. And this one he's, I'm trying to say with his courage here, is he was standing against the wickedness of that day. Wicked people have tore down the house of God. They've done wickedly, and I'm standing against wickedness, and I'm standing for the things of God. Good influences will encourage you to do that. I'll tell you something. These young men will stand on the street corner and preach. We'll go hand out gospel tracts. Anybody ever handed out gospel tracts before and been a little bit nervous when you did it? If you've ever handed out a gospel tract, your hand probably just went up. It is always nerve-wracking. It's always nerve-wracking to try to give a gospel track at a gas station, at a restaurant, or any of those places. It's always nerve-wracking. And when you're by yourself, listen now, when you're by yourself, you can talk yourself out of doing things for God. You know what? You get about three or four other guys. Look, I was, I was at, um, we were at a dollar store or something the other day. We stopped in there. We stopped in there to buy toilet paper for the, for the place we were staying at. We stopped in and we said, we just got to go get a few things in there. We were out and, and I saw a guy and he did not look like he was, you know, hungry for a gospel track. He, he, in fact, he looked like he was probably the opposite of hungry for a gospel track. And, uh, and so when I got there, I'm thinking to myself, should I give this guy a gospel track? And I thought, oh, good. I don't even have one in my pocket. I, I'm not even going to be able to give this guy a gospel track. I'm going to get by this. And then I looked over my shoulder, and there's Jeremiah standing there. So I was like, now I kind of feel a little bit like i got to give a gospel track. <laughs> and so I said, Jeremiah, you got a gospel track? He said, already got it ready, ready to give it to him. Do you want to do it, or do you want me to do it? And I said, uh, you can go ahead. And, I think you did it, didn't you? Yeah. Did I do it? Oh, I did it. Oh, praise the Lord. Look at that. <laughs> and so... So I was like, uh, I was like, here you go. I gave him a gospel track and said, hey, read this if you get a chance. You know what that is? When you're around other people, they will encourage you to be confident and stand up for the things of God and try to do things. Listen, it's, you know how hard it is to stand up here and do a solo and a song? I'm surprised if I ever sing that I don't short circuit the microphone because my hands will sweat like crazy. You know what? You get in the crowd of other people. It makes it a little easier to stand up for the things of God when you've got people with you. In all the days of Jehoiada, this man had commitment. This man had courage and confidence. And the consequences were, and uh, you, you look at verse number 9, and they made a proclamation through Judah and Jerusalem to bring into the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they had made an end. They got enough. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought unto the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribes and the high priest's officers came and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to his place again. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. And the king and Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So the workmen wrought, and the work was perfected by them. And they set the house of the Lord in his state and strengthened it. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money. Now, they brought in enough that it took care of everything. And then they're like, man, there's more than enough. They brought in that before the king of Jehoiada, wherefore were made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and to offer withal, and spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually. Watch this now. All the days of Jehoiada. 
The consequences of following somebody in your life that is giving good influence in your life is, man, there was a blessing. Everything was going well. There was good things happening in the kingdom at this time. Everything was destroyed before and everything's being restored. Everything is going good. It's been mended. It's been set in its proper state. And now the house of God and the people of God are all being strengthened. I mean, great things are happening. Would you not agree? The consequences of a good person in his life, it was good. But watch what it says in verse number 15. But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. 130 years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and towards house. Now watch what it says in the rest of this chapter i kind of read it a little bit, and then I'm going to kind of help you understand some things about it. Now, after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened to them. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Yet, and this is God's goodness, he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord. And they testified against them but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came across Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. And this would be the, the man that has been in his life to kind of influence him towards good. That man's son is now uh, one of the ones that's going to be speaking as a priest or the, a prophet. And the, 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 the Spirit of God comes along him. He comes there to tell them. It says, He stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, why trespass ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? He's saying, there's no way you can prosper because you're going against God. Because you've forsaken the Lord, He hath also forsaken you. And watch what they did. And they conspired against Him and stoned Him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, when Jehoiada's son died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. Very interesting statement. I'll read some of the rest to you in just a minute. And this is where I get the title for the, for the message, Your Ability to Stand. Some people can only do right when they have somebody in their life telling them to do right. Some people can only walk with God when there's somebody in their life telling them to walk with God. My question and my statement to you is, there should be a time in your life that you grow to a point that you begin to live out what somebody else has been trying to put into you. I made a few statements that I thought about yesterday. What is being influenced in you must become intact in you. It has to stop being just an influence. It has to be something that's intact. Or let me put it this way. What you're being guided into must be something you eventually grow into. You've got to have this become part of your life. It has to become part of you. You see, for Joash, just something that's very interesting. Joash gave his heart to Jehoiada for a little while, but he never gave his heart to God. I want, I want some of these things to sink in a little bit because this is the crux of the whole message is at some point, you have got to get to the place. Thank God for, for, for a mom. Thank God for a dad. Thank God for an aunt. Thank God for an uncle. Thank God for a grandma. Thank God for a grandpa. Thank God for a pastor. Thank God for teachers. Thank God for people in your life that are there to kind of push you along and say, listen, there's your left boundary. There's your right boundary. Stick with it. Keep going. Read your Bible. Pray. Spend time with God. Go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. Come to Sunday school. Do right. Don't do wrong. Stay away from this. Don't. Yeah, it's good to have someone in your life that's trying to help you and encourage you and get you the right way. And it's good for you to continue consider where they're taking you in the end of their conversation and follow them as they follow Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. You have got to get to some place in your life at some point that you have your own relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It isn't just, well, I, I'm, I'm walking with God while I'm with the pastor or if the pastor is looking. It's got to be something that you have your own walk with God. 
There's a lot of young people that they will stay in church as they're young and they grow up and then when they get out of church or when they get out of their parents' home, then then next thing you know, they don't have God anymore and their walk with God was connected to mom and dad and it never got into them. And before you think that this is a message about young people doing this, when you read this and really do a lot of research on it, it took me a little while to research this out, and you look at 2 Kings Whenever he was trying to get the the house in order and the people were just not doing it, the priests were not doing it, 2 Kings says that was in his 23rd year of reigning that that happened. He was over halfway through his 40-year reign when that was going on. So he only had 17 years left that he was going to be reigning. And the Bible is going to tell us in a minute, the year that he killed uh, Zechariah, the year that he killed Jehoiada's son, that exact same year that that son said, the Lord shall require it, the Lord required it that year, and his own servants conspired against him and killed him. So that tells me, if he reigned 40 years, simple math, and he was 7 years old when he began to reign, he was 47 years old when this happened. And in the 23rd year of his reign was when he's just trying to get the house in order. That means he was 30 years old. So between the age he was 30 years old and 47 years old, that's when he fell off. So before we start saying, look, all you six-year-olds, you know, you got to start doing right. And is when you leave your house, you're going to be bad. I'm saying some of you 30-year-olds and some of you 40-year-olds and some of you 47-year-olds, you need to keep going with God. Even if the preacher's not watching, even if Paul's not watching, grandma's not watching, you still got to walk with God. All of us have got to do it. And, and I thought, when I looked at that, I thought, now that is impressive the fact is, I, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody really expound on this, but I think if I would have, most people would have said, hey, you six-year-olds, you got to stick with God, and when you get out of mom and dad's house, you got to keep doing it. No, nope, 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds got to do it too. Listen, it's important that you get saved. Not just you, you start walking and you start going to church or, or you start, you know, I'm going to start giving my life to some principles. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Listen, none of that stuff gets you to heaven. Becoming a Baptist doesn't get you to heaven. Joining this church doesn't get you to heaven. Uh, a new denomination doesn't get you to heaven. Having a religious experience and somebody say I was, I was someplace and it was a really tough time in my life and the sun just came up and I felt a warm feeling inside of me and I just felt like I must be going to heaven when I die. That is not going to get you to heaven. That's not what the Bible says salvation is. Salvation is very, 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 very specific and very plain in the Bible. It is you have to realize you were a sinner separated from your God and that God sent His Son. We just sing about it. He sent His Son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. I deserve a penalty for my sins. He paid the penalty. He did nothing wrong, but he died on the cross to pay the penalty for sins. Listen, folks, listen. Here's a fantastic statement. If you could just turn over enough new leaves, um, be a better person, if you could earn it, why in the world would he have had to come and die? He died to pay for our sins. And then the Bible says he was buried, and he rose again the third day, victorious over sin, the grave, hell, death, and it rose back to the Father. And now the plan is, that has been preached all through the New Testament, is people going and proclaiming that truth, that if you put your faith and trust in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you can be gloriously saved, have a home in heaven, He becomes your Father, you're adopted into His family, and you have eternal life. At least three of you recognize that. That's salvation. But you know what else you need to do? You need to grow. You got people in your life that are trying. I mean, we're trying. I mean, if if you if you if you know me for any period of time, you know that I'm laboring to try to give you to serve you food that you can eat and live off of throughout the week. I mean, we're trying to give you the only thing left I have to do is to duct tape some of you to the chair and just stand right in front of you and say, You're gonna get this truth. I, I can't do that though. 
All I can do is try from up here to give you gospel truth for you to live on, and, and teachers to give you gospel truth in classes for you to live on, and Bible college to give you gospel truth and, and Bible truths for you to live on, and, and devotionals and, and, and podcasts and stuff to try to get truth out there for people to live on. And then you're going to have to, listen now, you're going to have to not just let be fed here by the spoons of the pastor. You're going to have to eventually at some point begin to walk on your own with God. And read the Bible and pray and spend time with Him and meditate on truths. And maybe some things, somebody said the other day, I read some stuff that I don't understand. And the Bible I gave away the other day to somebody had all my notes in it. Um, I have in, in Acts chapter 8, I have three places. A question mark, question mark, question mark. For years, I had no clue what one section was talking about. Later on in life, I was reading through, reading through my Bible, reading through my Bible, reading through my Bible. And it, all of a sudden, I read through that and it, it clicked. Oh, that's what that's talking about. I promise you, you're going to read through your Bible as you're trying to do this on your own. You're going to read through your Bible. You're going to run across things. You're like, I just don't get it. Let me tell you something. That's okay. (laughs) Well, I just don't get it. I'm going to throw in my Bible. I promise you, you read a newspaper. I don't even know they have newspapers anymore. But if you read a newspaper, I I guarantee you there's going to be a word somewhere in there. You're like, I just don't know that I understand that word. Crumble the whole thing up and throw it away. We don't do that. You don't do that with this either. Somebody told me one time, you do it like you're eating a, a T-bone. You eat, 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 till you hit a bone, go around it, eat, eat, eat some more. That's all you do. <laughs> That's what you do with your Bible. I mean, I'm, I'm pleading with you to just get your own walk with God. Because if you don't, you will do good all the days of Jehoiada, but you will not do good after the Jehoiadas of your life are out of the picture. You won't continue to do good. I almost preach this as the title, The Backbone of a Wet Noodle. I thought that may be too derogatory, but, I almost, but here's the deal. Some people never learn how to stand up and be strong with God. They can stand strong as long as Jehoiada is holding them up. But when Jehoiada lets them go, it's... And you know what they'll stand up with? Whoever else stands them up. And so when you read this, in verse number... 17 there, down. You see some pretty interesting things. Jehoiada is no longer the influence. Who becomes the influence? The princes of Judah. They come be his influence. And his commitment level that he used to have when he had Jehoiada in his life, his commitment was pretty good. Now his commitment level is beginning to wane. I want you to notice the progression. They left the house of God. That's what it says in verse 18. And they left the house of the Lord God and began to serve idols. There's a progression here that I've seen in people's lives forever. They're, they've left the house of God and now they're, they're doing something different. Verse number 19, people have come to try to tell them, hey, look, you used to be on track and now you're off track. Can you, can you please just get back on track? And the next thing it says is, but they would not give ear. When you don't have a Jehoiada in your life and you have never learned to be strong on your own, eventually, the house of God. Now for them, it's a temple. I'm not trying to connect the two completely, but the things of God are a little bit different in the New Testament than they were in the Old Testament with the house of God. But for us, we would say, coming to a place where you're getting truth. <clears throat> what happens is, when you replace the good influence with the wrong influence, the first thing that starts happening is, I just don't have time for the things of God anymore that I used to be committed to. And then when someone's telling you, you have no ear for them to listen. Verse number 20, though, it, it moved from them just forsaking the house of God to where he says at the end of it, you have forsaken the Lord. And I've watched this happen with people forever. Now, listen now, I want you to tell you, the progression is they left the house of God They would not listen to someone giving them any kind of instruction. They would not give ear. They progressed to forsaking the Lord altogether. Don't even want the Lord. And finally, in verse number 21, they get to the place that they hate anybody that would come and try to give them any kind of rebuke. You realize correction is part of your life? And you know what he did? It says in verse number 17, the princes of Judah, and they made obeisance to the king. They they, they gave him some kind of glory. They, 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 they flattered him. Let me make a couple of statements to you. 
Flattery may feel better than a faithful and honest counsel, but it is rarely better. Flattery may feel better. Yay, come with us. We're going to have fun and you're going to be great. And I'm sure I'm glad you're part of the group and you're part of this. Flattery may feel really good to you. But when people are flattering you to pull you away from the things of God, it may feel good for the moment, but I promise you it doesn't last. Let me ask you a question. How easily influenced are you into sin and questionable practices? If it's pretty easy, then you don't have much strength. His commitment that he used to have, it's no longer has it. His courage and his confidence that he used to have towards getting rid of evil things, now it's the exact opposite. Now it's bringing evil things in and getting ready of the godly things. In fact, here's what's something that's very interesting is when you read it in 2 second, in second Kings like 11 and 12, when you read over there, all the things that he had brought into the house and the new gold and the and utensils and all that stuff, the Bible says in those areas that he sold those things off to buy off enemies. The things that used to, listen now, listen real close, the things that used to be important the things of God, the the house of God, uh, uh, worshiping God, those things are no longer important. Listen, some of you can probably feel, I think I'm traveling down this road right now. There was a time in my life when I was committed to the things of God. There was a time in my life that I was courageous to stand up for, for God. I was confident in the God. And there was a time in my life when the consequences were good consequences. But I can feel that I'm on the wrong track right now in my life. And my commitment is not to the things of God anymore. They're more into my pleasures and my things. And I, I really don't have a reverence for the things of God anymore. And now I'm, I'm more serving idols than I am anything else. I'm going down the wrong road. And my confidence that used to be for God now my confidence is I'm actually emboldened against the things of God. I hope that you're silent because you're thinking. Listen, the company we keep holds considerable sway over our actions and our choices. Our companions can give us the courage to engage in activities that we may not undertake alone. Just like I said, giving out a gospel track or staying on a street corner and saying Jesus is the only way to heaven, a crowd will help you to do that. Let me tell you something else. A crowd of friends that are going the wrong way can help you to do some things you never would have done without them. I told you the story several times, but I did a work to case in CID one time, and the guy was going to prison for a long time. He was going to go, I forget how many years they sent those guys away. They committed murder. <clears throat> and uh, it was, um, there was a, a, a two groups, race groups, who were in the barracks here at Fort Hood. And, uh, and they, they, one of them said, one guy said a smart comment to another guy. That guy said a smart comment back. They got in a fight. He got beat up pretty bad. That night, he got his friends, and they went, they're going to go back to that guy's room, and they were going to beat him up. And this young guy, he's like 19 years old, he's a private, they say, hey, you go with us. We just want you to stand outside the room and, and tell us if anybody shows up. He, all he did was stood outside the room. They, he knew they were going there to beat the guy up. They went overboard beating him up, and the guy died. Now, if you don't know anything about, like, the ju- judicial system, I'm going to try to say that fast, that was kind of came out wrong, the judicial system, that was conspiracy. And he is going to serve the same thing as the guy that swung the blow that killed the man. And him standing there in, in our office being interrogated and crying, listen now, the crying that he did that day does not assuage anybody. It doesn't change anything about where he'll spend his life from then on. And he would say, I wish I could go back and just say no and undo. You can't go back and undo at that point. Now, once they put the handcuffs on and they take you somewhere, it's hard to undo any of that. And you know what the deal was? He never would have thrown a punch at that other guy. 
but a crowd talked him into standing there while they did it. And he had the consequences of it. Your courage and your confidence that you can get somebody good in your life that's saying, hey, do something big for God and I'm cheering you on. You can do it and, and live for God. And that, those are all good things and the consequences are good. But you can also, if you never learn how to stand on your own, when that Jehoiada is not in your life, you can get around some other people that say, hey, Jehoiada's not around anymore. Let's do this. And if you don't learn how to stand on your own, I don't care if you're 16, I don't care if you're 36. You better learn how to stand on your own. They were even emboldened against hatred for the man of God. I've seen that before. I've seen people that one day I'm telling them, I love you and I'm trying to get you on the right track. The next day, nothing's changed here. Something's just changed in them that they have the hatred for you because you've tried to tell them. Paul said, have I become... He said, I I remember the blessedness that you spoke of, how you would have done, and you've listed all the stuff you would have done for me. He said, but now I've become your enemy because I've told you the truth. Galatians, he told him that. In Proverbs 14, 16, it says, A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. Think about that for a minute. The fool rageth and is confident. You know what? You get around the wrong people, and you can become confident. Listen real close. If you don't hear anything else, listen to this. You become confident in your foolishness confident in your foolishness because of the people you're allowing to influence you. And what were the consequences? Look at verse number 23. He said, the Lord's going to look at it. The Lord's going to require it. I promise you the Lord will require it. Verse 23, and it came to pass at the end of the year, <clears throat> that year, didn't even take a year, that the hosts of Syria came up against him and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed All the, watch this, princes of the people. The same crowd, I drew a line between that verse and verse number 17. The princes that told him, hey, let's go off in the wrong direction. The princes are the ones that end up dead. The princes of all the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them unto the kings of Damascus. For the army of Syria came with a small company of men. Now let me talk about the consequences It was a big army of Judah and a small company of Syria. And small, normally with God, small armies can defeat great enemies when you've got the power of God. But now here is a small enemy defeating a great army of God. Why? Because they have no power. A great host under their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. And when they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases... It's interesting that he ended up with diseases. His own servants did what? Conspired. He conspired against the servant of God, and then now his servants conspired against him. The Lord does have a way to require things. His own servants conspired against him for the blood of the son of Jehoiada the priest and slew him in his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulchres of the king's. What a disgrace. A man that started off so good ended up so disgraceful. I'm just saying to you today, who are you letting influence you? Are they helping your commitment to God or are they hindering your commitment to God? Are they helping your courage and your confidence towards God or are they hindering your confidence and your courage towards God? Are they helping you have good consequences with God or are they hindering and bringing bad consequences with God? The psalmist said in Psalm 1, 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's what we want. Bad influence will take you in a bad direction. David said this in Psalm 28, 3, Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors. Peace, brother, peace. Doing good. How are you doing in church today? Doing good. Everything's peaceful. Everything's great. But mischief in their hearts. He said, keep me away from that. Psalm 101, 3, last verse. 
I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Are you letting the work of iniquity cleave to you? He says, a forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Now, I'm not, this is not to say, let me, let me clarify something. It's not to say that you don't try to go out to people that aren't right and try to win them and try to find a way to, 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 to work with them. I'm not saying that. Um, Jesus did that. I'm saying, who are you letting influence you? Influence you. People say all the time, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get together with old so-and-so, and I just think I'm going to rub off on them. It doesn't ever work that way. It never really does. Now, you can try to find people you can try to influence, but for the most part, it doesn't really work that way. Let me read this little poem to you. I, I wasn't going to do this before, but I'm going to read this to you, and then we'll be done. It says, when you are around a hot-tempered man, does it have a good effect on you or a bad one? How many of you, when you get through watching uh, or, reading, or wa- listening to or watching some of the podcasts that are aggressive towards like the government, how many of you feel like super spiritual after you get through? Or how many of you feel angry? How many of you feel angry? Okay, I'm not saying you don't have to watch. I'm just saying the Bible talks about making a connection with an angry man lest you learn his ways. All right? When you are with a gossip, are you at times led into gossip yourself? Don't say that. Don't answer that one. When you're with a person who is always complaining, do you often join in complaining? When you're around people who use profanity and tell dirty jokes, does it help your mind to dwell on what is lovely and what is honorable? Are you as offended by their foul speech the 20th time you hear it as you were the first time? Or do you find yourself suddenly being desensitized? I'm just telling you, getting around the right influences in your life will help you. The wrong influences will hurt you. But on top of all that, you need to learn at some point to be able to stand on your own with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand to our feet. If you're not saved this morning, I would say this. The first step to standing is you getting saved. And after that is you growing with the Lord, having a walk with the Lord that grows. She's going to play. After she gets through playing, and give you a chance to maybe come to an altar and pray. If, you, um, if you're not saved this morning, come down to the altar. You can get some of the attention. I might pray with you and show you. Uh, but if you are saved, you can find a place and just spend some time talking to the Lord about wherever you're at in your walk with God. Hopefully that will be a help to you. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, your grace, your goodness. Lord, I pray that you please help us as we try to apply these truths to our lives. Father, help us to be people that influence others in the right direction. Father, help us to be people that are influenced in the right direction. Father, help us to not allow acquaintances that we have in our life that maybe we're trying to win over or trying to influence for good, not to let them influence us in the wrong direction. And then, Father, I pray for someone lost here, they get saved. And Father, I pray you'd help us to be strong and strengthened for you. I pray you'd renew our commitment, our confidence, and our courage towards you. Lord, do the work now in the hearts of people that really only you can do. I've tried to be honest to your word, and now I'm, I'm, I'm hoping your Holy Spirit would make application to their lives. And Father, bless us now and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. She's going to play. You can come pray this morning if you have something to pray about.